So we've made it to topic number three, framing, and it's a fun one. We're gonna break it down into two parts, the first being the basics, followed by part two, covering auxiliary items such as windows, roofs, roughens, things of that nature. But before we jump right into codes, materials, and techniques, a brief recap over what has been done up to this point to prepare for this stage of construction. First, in most cases, the property has been excavated to provide room to form the basement along with its footing. As we spoke about in earlier videos, the foundation walls allow homes in colder climates to sit below the frost level while the footings spread the weight of the home so all this can be accomplished by the soil condition at a higher depth. Once your foundation wall is cured and lined with an air gap membrane or waterproofing, as well as a perimeter drain and stone, you're ready to get a backfill inspection which focuses particularly on the sill cuts and what the respective slope will be to surrounding areas. Now this is very important because certain gradient conditions are required to protect the home and adjacent properties against their greatest threat which is water. And at this stage, it's very easy to raise or lower the sills. Say for instance, if your garage is too far above or below the grading of the street level. However, once you begin adding structural things such as steel girders and affixing interchangeable components, these small issues quickly become very costly to rectify. Okay, so we just want to constantly review and check what's been done because mistakes definitely do happen. After this, of course, the overdig that has been provided around the walls for the foundation work is infilled so the trades can proceed safely. Now, when it comes to framing, your material suppliers really are your one-stop shop. While architectural drawings commonly associated with plans illustrate the home's overall design, building permits from the city required for construction to actually commence call for stamped engineer drawings for the critical areas, including the floor and roof. They check very meticulously for the materials rated spans, the distribution of point loads, the hardware used to secure the members, the nailing schedule, and so on. The main aim in doing so is of course to assure that all areas of the home are structurally sound and able to support the going dead and variable loads which are typically assumed to be 40 PSF in residential environments, specified as 1.9 kPa in the Ontario Building Code. With respect to the walls, they typically just modify the material and layout depending on the height and ask you for instance to double up studs every so often or use a beefier 2x6 stock. With the actual hands-on assembly of a home, there's a few common items that carpenters use to contour the majority of it. First there are the sill and plates which commence the bottom of the wall or tie together the top. These are typically 2x4 or 2x6 pieces depending on the area and size of the wall. If you remember from the previous video on foundations, this was the intermediary I was talking about in between the top of the concrete wall and the members for the first floor. Then there are joists, which span horizontally support the carrying capacity of the floor. These are typically web engineered pieces in contemporary situations that are spaced on center in combination with span requirements that are dictated by the material grade stiffness as well as rigidity values. There are also girders, which divide the floor into more than one length if needed, supplying a ledge to hang joists. Now, since these are pricier members, you try to mitigate their use by running the joist bands in the direction of the exterior walls with the least distance, so some stacked towns with lower floor area don't even feature them. However, since these beams act as a bearing platform and transfer the weight of the floors down to a solid base, much like a foundation wall, they follow the same footing protocol at the bottom and require a solid continuous post to carry the point load in the form of either a steel lally column or filled concrete blocks. Atop of the joists, there's a subfloor paneling, which is commonly plywood or its engineered oriented strand board counterpart, typically 5 8 of an inch thickness. This is what closes off the spans while simultaneously tying them in, so you'll also see the same material being used on the roof as well as exterior walls, which then have a protective overlay material such as house wrap, which blocks moisture present in things like rainwater from penetrating the sheeting while allowing vapor from the interior to migrate outside. These synthetic membranes are then complemented by weep holes at the bottom of the brick veneer finish as a means of egress. There are studs which erect from the plates vertically to form the wall and support elevated levels and floors. And then there are headers, trimmers and cripples which supply extra support for the discontinuities in the floor and wall formed by voids left by a stairwell, windows and doors. Now roofs follow very similar principles as the rest of the home so I'm not going to go into too much depth on them because most times trusses are prefab engineered when they arrive and placed via cranes but slope for discharge and their amalgamation with the top plate so there's proper ventilation throughout the attic is really what you're looking for during the framing phase. 
So that's it for the introduction. Part two is going to dive into the items that then synergize with framing, particularly the roofing, the windows, as well as the rough-ins for things like HVAC, electrical, and plumbing. So I hope you enjoyed this video and stay tuned because more content is on its way.